Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and we're going to learn how to play Marvel Dice Masters Avengers vs. X-Men, which is published by WizKids and was designed by Mike Elliott and Eric Lang. In the game, two players will form teams of Marvel superheroes that, in classic comic book fashion, end up facing off against one another. But the teams will be comprised of cards and dice the players choose from their collections to bring to the table. I'm going to show you exactly how to play the beginner game using the starter box, which contains everything two players need to start playing the game. And then in a follow-up video, I'm going to cover the remaining rules as well as how to play at the tournament level and how you can use expansion packs to further customize your teams. But for now, join me at the table and let's learn how to play. The game comes with eight different characters with three unique cards each that are distinguished by their subtitles. You'll be able to build your team using the version of the character you think best fits your playstyle or the kind of team that you're trying to form. Although the character cards are unique, each version of a single character uses the same character dice. The starter set provides two dice for each of the characters included, which you can identify by matching them to the die faces shown on the bottom of the character cards. These are the ten included basic action cards, and they can be identified by their subtitles. There are three basic action dice that come in four different colors that match the color reminder cards shown here that we'll use in a moment. These remaining 16 dice are called sidekicks. The set also provides two dice bags for the players to use during gameplay. And in the center of the rulebook, you'll find this player mat. You can also download and print this off from WizKidsGames.com. I've done that. I've put it on photo paper and then mounted it onto some foam core, which you can find at most hobby shops. This is really helpful when you're first learning the game, so I suggest you get two copies printed out and put one in front of each player. For our first game, one player will take Human Torch, playing with fire, and Spider-Man Webhead. The other player should take Beast, Mutate 666, and Captain America, American Hero. Each character should keep their character cards, with character dice on them, on their side of the table. We'll also use three basic action cards, Force Beam, Inner Rage, and Throne Car. Basic actions don't have a specific color of die shown on them. Instead, you choose a color reminder card to place under them, and then put the three basic action dice on top that matches the assigned color. The basic action should be placed in a neutral area close to both of the players, but now each player can take eight of the sidekick dice, put them in their dice bag, and return any remaining components to the box, because now we have everything set up for a beginner game. In Marvel Dice Masters, you're a mastermind with a rather weak bag of sidekicks fighting for you, but as you draw them out and roll them, you'll be able to recruit better characters from those that you chose during the setup. And it's very important to note, you can only recruit from the character cards that you chose, not from your opponents, but each player can recruit any of the basic action dice. Each player starts with a number of life points. In a normal game, it would be 20, but for a beginner game, you might want to start with 10 points each. And you can keep track of this using a pen and paper, or as I've done here, I just grabbed a couple of dice, and I'm keeping track of it that way. If you can reduce your opponent's life points to zero, then you win the game. The game takes place over a series of turns which alternate between the players, and on your turn, you're going to complete a number of steps, starting with the clear and draw step. In later turns, you may have some dice already in your reserve pool. If so, you begin this step by clearing them into your used pile. And that's one of the reasons why this player mat is so useful. It has the different areas designated, and also some of the rules are written in as helpful reminders. So that's the clear portion of the clear and draw step. And now it's time to draw, without looking, four random dice from your dice bag. Now you'll move on to the roll and re-roll step. So shake up your dice and let them roll. Didn't get what you wanted? No problem. You may choose as many as you'd like to gather up and re-roll once more as a group. Then place your rolled dice into your reserve pool, keeping the facings that they're showing. Because of certain game effects, you may start with some dice already in your prep area. In those cases, after drawing four dice from the bag, add the prep area dice to your hand as well, and roll them all together. Of course, at the start of the game, you'll be rolling the standard four dice. So we had the clear and draw, and then the roll and re-roll step. Now it's time for the main step. Here, you'll be able to take a variety of different actions as often as you want, and in any order, as long as you have the resources to pay for them. 
For example, one of the actions is to purchase a die. Now you can purchase a die from any of your own character cards or from any of the basic action cards and you'll pay for them by using energy in your reserve pool. So let's take a look right now at the four main kinds of energy. Here we see fist, bolt, mask, and shield. Each symbol you see provides one energy of that type. So this face would provide one bolt energy and this would provide two. If you roll a question mark, then it can be used as any type of energy that you want. But there's also generic energy, which is shown with a number inside of a circle. This counts as two energy, but not of a particular type. So if you specifically needed fist energy, you couldn't use this generic die roll. To purchase a die, examine the cost, which is shown in the upper left-hand corner of its matching card. For example, a human torch die costs two energy. If you see a specific energy type shown with the cost, then at least one of the energy spent must match that type. So I'll need to have at least one bolt energy to spend. Looking at what's in my reserve pool, I could spend one fist and one bolt to purchase a human torch die. The die you purchase and any used to pay for it are then placed into your used pile. Basic action dice have a cost as well but no specific energy type is required to pay for it, so you could use a combination of generic energy and normal energy to purchase one of these dice. Instead of energy, you may roll a character. A beast die, for example, has three sides that provide energy and three other sides that represent the character itself that can be brought into play. Even a sidekick die has a single character side. These faces have a unique icon in the middle that represents the character and four possible stats. A fielding cost, attack value, defense value, and possibly one or two burst symbols. Character cards will list the character faces in order of level. So this is a level one Captain America die and this would be considered a level three. One of the options you have during the main step is to field characters you've rolled. So for this example, let's just pretend we had previously recruited a Spider-Man die and had rolled one of its character faces. To field it, I pay the cost shown here in energy of any type, which then gets moved from my reserve pool to the used pile. So I could spend this fist energy to field this Spider-Man die, moving it into the field zone. Sometimes the field cost will be zero, like on this sidekick die, so the character can just go right into the field zone if you choose. But you never have to feel the character just because you can. Although at the end of the main step, any unfielded characters are moved into your used pile. Another option during the main step is to play actions. And in your starter box, these will come from the basic action cards. But with expansions, you'll be able to add action cards specifically to your team that only you can use. Action dice will either have sides that provide generic energy or that will allow you to activate the ability shown on the action card. Instead of generic energy, action dice collected from expansion packs will provide a specific type. If you have an action die in your reserve, you may choose to move it to your used pile to resolve its ability. Bursts shown on the die may enhance that effect. If a card has burst effects, then they are not optional. You must apply them and they'll be listed here on the card. But some cards don't have burst effects, so if you roll burst symbols, in those cases you would just ignore them and resolve the normal effect as listed on the card. In this case, if I had rolled this action die, it has no burst, so I would just apply the normal effect of dealing one damage to each character, including my own. If I had rolled this action with two bursts, instead I would deal one damage to each player and two damage to each character. It's important to note a double burst cannot be used to trigger a single burst effect. Another option in the main step is to use global abilities which are found on some cards printed in red. Any player can activate any global ability even during another player's turn regardless of whose card it is. So you can almost think of the global ability as being separate from the card itself because if this is on my team, I'm still the only player who can recruit Iron Man dice from it but the global ability is available to everyone. For example, this one says, pay one shield energy to redirect one damage from you to one of your characters. So if during my turn I somehow cause damage to my opponent, 
my opponent could announce that they're going to spend one of the shield energy in their reserve pool, move it into their used pile, and activate this global ability. It doesn't matter that there's no Iron Man dice in play and that none have been purchased yet. The global ability is available to anyone. Now, if two players want to resolve a global ability at the same time, then the active player, the person whose turn it is, they get to resolve it first, and then the other player can respond. At the end of your main step, unused actions and energy can stay in your reserve. And now that you've seen global abilities, you can probably tell why that would be a good idea. But as I mentioned, unfielded characters must now be moved to your used pile. Before we moved on, we also saw that some of the character dice can provide up to two energy per side. But if you just need to spend one energy, you can do so and then spin down the die to the one energy side to show what's left over. Generic energy can't be spun down, so unused energy is wasted, but you can spend the energy on two different things at once to prevent losing any. So for example, you could use one of the generic energy to feel the character, and then the leftover energy you could use in combination with other energy in your reserve to purchase a die. Something else to note is that each character card has a text box with unique abilities that occur when it tells you. For example, when you feel the Captain America die from this card, you may take a sidekick die from your used pile and roll it, adding it to your reserve. After the main step, it's time for the attack step. For this example, I'm going to pretend our players have been playing for a little while and they've fielded some better characters onto their player mats. During the attack step, the active player, that is, the player whose turn it is, can continue playing action dice they have in their reserve pool, and both players can pay for global abilities if they have the resources to do so. Again, if there's a conflict and both players want to do something at the same time, then always the active player gets to resolve their effect first, and then the other player can respond. The attack step is optional, and it starts by choosing some or all of your fielded dice and moving them from the field zone into the attack zone. There's no energy cost to do this. And although some card effects will target dice in the field, this also includes dice in the attack zone. So to help remember this, you can think of the attack zone as a special part of the field. If there are abilities that trigger when characters attack, they get resolved, and then the opponent declares blockers by moving any characters they wish from their field zone to the attack zone. Each blocker can only be assigned to a single attacker, but you could have several blockers assigned to the same attacker. For example, Captain America cannot be assigned to block both the Human Torch and Spider-Man, but Beast could come over here and help Captain America block the Human Torch. Now it's time to assign damage. Any attacking character assigns its attack value as damage against any dice assigned to block it. If the attacker has more than one blocker, as in the case of the Human Torch, then the attacking player decides how to divide up the damage between the blockers. So in this case, the Human Torch, with an attack value of 4, can split that up between Captain America and the Beast as the controlling player sees fit. Likewise, the blockers assign their attack values as damage to the characters they are blocking, adding their values together if more than one is blocking a single attacker. So in this case, Beast and Captain America have an attack value of 2 and 3, which they add together for a total attack value of 5, which will be damage assigned to the Human Torch. All damage is resolved simultaneously to the attackers and blockers, and any characters that receive damage equal or greater than their defense value are knocked out and moved to the prep area. But if multiple card effects trigger during damage and there's a conflict, treat it as if the attacker's damage resolved first. So when resolving this battle here, we notice that the Beast's ability says, when Beast blocks, draw one die and place it in your prep area. So I drew a sidekick from my bag and I'll place it in my prep now. Looking at the damage, the Human Torch is assigning an attack value of 4 and wants to put all of it against my Beast character, which has a defense of 4. So that means the Beast is going to be knocked out. Before he goes, though, he contributes his attack strength to Captain America's for a total of 5, which against the Human Torch's defense of 4 means the Human Torch is also going to be knocked out. So with Beast and Human Torch knocked out and placed in their respective prep areas, we still have this Spider-Man character with an attack value of 4 that went unblocked. So this damage will go directly against my life total, reducing me from 10 down to 6. And something worth mentioning, damage lasts until the end of the turn. 
So if I had instead used this Captain America to block Spider-Man, he would have done a total damage of three, but Spider-Man has a defense of four. So this would have reduced Spider-Man's defense to one for the rest of the turn. So if I had an action die or some other ability that would cause one additional damage to Spider-Man, that would be enough to knock him out. Characters can receive modifications to their attack and defense from card effects, which last until the current turn ends and are shown as either positive or minus A or D, attack or defense. If more than one modification is being applied to a character, then add them all together first before assigning them. And although a character's values can never be reduced below zero, if its defense value reaches zero, then it's immediately knocked out. So after the attack step, there's one step left, cleanup. Now all characters that took damage but were not knocked out are restored to full health. And characters that attacked but were not blocked by another character, like Spider-Man was, go directly to that player's used pile. All other characters that were engaged in fights where there were attackers and blockers but were not knocked out then go back to their field zone. Any action dice in a player's reserve are now moved to the used pile as well. Finally, any effects that last a turn end now, because it's the end of the turn, and now the next player can start theirs with the clear and draw step. Now eventually, you're gonna go reaching into your bag and there's not gonna be enough dice there. Let's say it was my clear and draw step and yeah, sure enough, there's only two dice left here. Now you take all of the dice in your used pile, put them back into your dice bag, shake it up, and then draw any remaining dice that you're owed. Also, it's important to note that if there's a conflict in what a card text says you can do, and the rules that I've explained to you, then the card text always wins out. Well, that's everything you need to know in order to start playing this beginner game. The game will be available in spring of 2014, with starter sets retailing at $14.99 and expansion packs for $0.99. Cents. Expansion packs will come with two random dice and two corresponding cards to match them. And if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to put them in the comments of this video and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. And I hope you'll join us for the next video because I'm going to go over how to build and customize your own full team like the one I have here. I'll also go over any other card effects and interactions that we didn't discuss in this video. But until then, thanks for watching.